Ready? Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Pablo Mendoza. I'm uh, an associate professor at the Department of Civil Engineering at the Universidad de Chile. Welcome to a new version of our Water Resources and Environment webinars here at the Universidad de Chile. It is my immense pleasure to introduce today's speakers to you. Uh, today we have Dr. Catherine Dizama. She's a civil engineer, engineer and she holds a master's degree at uh, Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile. Uh, Dr. Lizama also holds a PhD in civil engineering from Monash University. Uh, Dr. Lizama is assistant professor in the civil engineering department at the Water Resources and Environment Division of Universidad de Chile. Her work areas include environmental engineering, water quality and control, geochemistry of metals and metalloids in aquatic systems, and natural, and natural treatment systems, such as constructed wetlands for water pollution control. So Catherine, please welcome, and thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you, Pablo. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon to the world. Good afternoon to you here at Universidad de Chile. Pablo has said enough, so I'm going to start with my seminar today, which we are talking about a very interesting topic that I've developed as a research line for a very long time. So that's where we're going to talk about today. So this is not working now. I don't know why, but OK. OK, thank you, Nicolas. So today, we are going to talk about constructed wetlands. Here you can see a very nice constructed wetland in uh, Valencia, Spain. But the main topic that is, has been a research line for myself is to do with the presence of arsenic in water, which is not the main application of constructed wetlands. So that's why it's a very interesting research topic. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Back from my PhD till today, a lot has happened. So I'm gonna try to show you the most important aspects that we have developed in these years, including uh, research overseas and research here at Universidad Chile. So very important, I would say, findings about the research and um, most importantly, what's going on today and what's going on the year after and the, in the future, hopefully, expecting to eventually to implement these technologies for arsenic in the world. So the word arsenic, I'm sure most of you have heard of this word that it sounds very scary. Well, it is. <laughs> it is very scary because even though it's a natural metalloid occurring in our earth, in water, in soil, in the atmosphere, the problem is that it's extremely toxic. It's not essential. We don't need arsenic. Actually, nobody needs arsenic to survive. That's the difference with the heavy metal, heavy metals such as iron, manganese, zinc, which are essential. So basically, the presence of arsenic in water, which is the main source of intake in the world, has been an issue in different parts of the world, especially those in the Bangladesh area, countries such as India, Bangladesh, China, Mongolia, that until today, they are drinking water with arsenic. And this is a natural cause most of the time. And similarly, that's the case here, not only in Chile, but also in Latin America, which I'm going to show you right now. What is the problem with arsenic? Well, several problems, including arsenic acid, but mainly cancer. And this has been shown, especially in our cities, Antofagasta, Alama, et cetera, that we have solved to a certain extent. I'm going to talk a little, talk about a little bit about that also. but. This is a problem worldwide. And what do we know about this problem? Well, not only engineers as myself, but also colleagues such as from the geology department, from the world, they invited me to this very long review that 
we covered the presence of arsenic in the 20 countries in Latin America. That's terrible, right? But that's the way it is. So if you're interested, you can read the whole paper. <laughs> Hopefully you're interested, but not only, it's not only us, but also our neighbors, Argentina, Peru, Bolivia, and mainly the presence of arsenic is focused, and that's why we share this problem in the Tiplan of Una region. So that's why our neighbors are as, as damaged as we are with this natural process. So what's our reality in Chile? Well, the Loa River has been a hotspot, a study for a very long time, even from people from the whole world. Actually, the Loa River, which is fed by the Empatio River out in the geysers, probably some of you know the geysers, study. very nice. But naturally, this is the place with the highest concentration of arsenic in water. Yes, so that's why this has been well known for a very long time. Let's say from 2003, um, Romero et al. did a very nice work throughout the whole basin. But unfortunately, there are other basins, such as Ruta, the Utah River, which is fed by the Super River, which also are very rich in arsenic. And they are now becoming as famous, and not, not such famous as the Loire River, but I would say quite famous. And that's, that's been another contribution of the colleagues from Universidad Católica, which who invited me to this review that is to do the water quality in Chile. Not only arsenic, but to do with the water quality in our country, which is very viable. We know we have different weathers, bad luck, good luck, more water, less water. So naturally we have these hydrological processes very different throughout the Chile and also the natural presence of pollutants such as arsenic, boron, nitride, and other pollutants. So what we can see here, or you'll see when you read it, is that those basins that I showed you, especially Loa and Utah, but also some in the south, such as Matayito, south, so we do have arsenic in the south as well. Not only, this is the very critical, this is the very worst case, but that doesn't mean that we are arsenic free from other basins. And that has been incremented by the drought, especially in groundwater. So this, even though these concentrations are terribly high, if we think that the, the national, the international, the WHO recommends that we don't drink arsenic above 0.01 milligrams per liter. And we have here, we have here one milligram per liter, two milligrams, three, it's very high. So we can't drink this water. But in some cases, we don't need the water to drink, but we need it for other uses, such as irrigation, especially in the North. So, as I was saying before, one of the key hotspots in Chile is the Triplano Puna. So recently we published a review using the data from the National uh, Agency uh, of Water, the GEAN, when we took their data, our data that belong to all of us, and also some historical data from different colleagues from different basins, starting from Altiplanicas, Salar de Atacama, Pampa del Camarugal, Loa, Utah, etc. And we collect all this data and look at it. And as you can see in this figure, concentrations can be as high as one milligram per liter. And this shows both historical data and also data from the National Monitoring Network, from our surface water mini. So not very good news, but as I was saying before, we have solved this problem at some extent, at least for drinking water purposes. So what, would, what was happening before in the big cities, a lot of people suffer from cancer, especially in these two main cities, until these uh, drinking water treatment plants included an additional treatment for arsenic removal. 
which of course improved the quality of life of many people so far until today, but nothing is perfect, especially in water treatment. You can't make the pollutants disappear, especially arsenic, because all the arsenic that you took away from the water, it's here in the sludge. And it's not like the typical sludge from a wastewater treatment plant or a drinking water treatment plant, it's a toxic sludge. So that's the main disadvantage. So even though people drink water that is safe, or according to the international standards, we still have some issues for other uses, other water uses. And also the problem that what, what to do with this water, what, what to do with these latches, and especially what will happen with, that is something that we also discussed in this study, in this study is what happens with the people that doesn't live in the big cities, such as Calama and Tofagasta. There are a lot of drinking water plants that they lack of water treatment. And they drink the water directly from the groundwater or from the river or from whatever. So that's, we also discussed that issue in our paper. Um, unfortunately, most of these treatments that are provided by our state, they can't keep operating because of the elevated costs, such as, you know, all associated to a skin reverse osmosis, maybe, that people that live here, they don't have the capacity to operate a reverse osmosis to do water treatment plant. So even though we could say we have progress a lot, and we have, we still have to think about what else could we do about this issue? And especially thinking something that is sustainable. And not necessarily to drink the water, but at least to reduce this concentration. So that made me think a long time ago, as I told you at the beginning, what could we do about it? And that led me to think of natural systems that now we, we are famous for being named as uh, natural-based solutions. But a few years ago, that, that concept didn't exist. And we stuck to natural systems. Uh, and I'm sure you've heard of wetlands. So what are wetlands that inspire constructed wetlands, which are a water treatment system mainly? A wetland is a natural soil, in, a, in the case of a natural wetland, that gets saturated at some point during the year. And that saturation of the soil allows the vegetation to grow. So for me, a wetland has to have vegetation, for me. But what we have learned from nature along these years is that naturally wetlands improve water quality, naturally. Because all of the interactions between the vegetation, the water, and the supporting media. So that's what we learned. As, um, that's why constructed wetlands are an engineering system with the main aim to improve water quality. So as I was saying in the beginning, constructed wetlands, they have been widely used in different parts of the world, but for different purposes, mainly wastewater, that was our prior worry from the engineering point of view. But now we have learned through the years as well that wetlands, constructed wetlands, they also have the potential not only to remove arsenic, but also pharmaceutical, other type of emerging pollutants, including arsenic, but the problem is we didn't know much about it. So that came very handy to me. So as to propose my PhD dissertation that I'm going to tell you about. I would say it's relatively new in the world. And what we can say about nature-based solution? Well, they are, I share here the definition of the International Union for the Conservancy of Nature. So I'm not gonna read it because you can read it by yourself. But the important thing is that here in Chile, this year, the President Boric signed the Ley Marco Cambio Climatico, Chilean Climate Change Law. And what you can see there, a lot of interesting topics that interest all of us due to the, all the issues we're uh, relating to the topic of this presentation today, nature-based solutions. So they are there. 
and that not only the definition that is, I would say, very in line with the international definition, but also this law that is already on, uh, um, is already functioning, let's say. This law also tell us about these strategic water resources plans that we have to have for each basin. We have 101 basins in Chile, and all of them at some stage, I don't know when, how, but all of them, they have to have the hydrological modeling, the water quality modeling, they have a aquifer recuperation plan, but also they made an explicit emphasis on nature-based solutions to face all the issues we are living today in Chile. And also not only in, in nature-based solutions, but also other new water sources, let's say, desalinization, artificial uh, aquifer recharge, new sources, relatively new. Um, wastewater reuse, this kind of thing. So we have made a lot of progress, at least on paper. We'll see in real life, but at least on paper, our state has made this commitment. So as I was saying, because we didn't know a lot about arsenic removal in wetlands, it occurred to me that it would be a nice topic to research for four years. And that allowed me to get my PhD degree in Melbourne, Australia. And because very little had been done, it was relatively simple, not easy, simple to start thinking, well, how, how, what is the potential of the system to improve water quality that is highly polluted with arsenic and other metals having as inspiration my country, as I told you before. So I started thinking, well, what could be used to improve this natural capacity of vegetation, soil, looking at different wetland media, for example, that not many people had done till then. It was more than 10 years ago, so a lot has happened. And then thinking about testing. So my PhD thesis was mainly empirical. So to do that, we had to get the plants from natural wetlands, we had to build the systems. These are the first vertical flow wetlands that I tested. These are the horizontal uh, wetlands that Richard helped me build and operate. And as I was saying, I took the very worst case that was the Sufri River. This water is very nasty, very nasty. You won't believe how nasty this water is. I couldn't believe it myself. So this water is most, is, I would say, very similar to a, a acid mine drainage, and it's a river. So that was very challenging because, I, as I was saying, the good thing is that nobody had done a lot, but on the other hand, I had to do everything. So the first thing that I, that I did was to propose what were the main mechanisms that occur in a constructed weather. And I realized, that nobody had identified these mechanisms so far. So that was our first contribution with my supervisor at the time, my both supervisors. And after this, we decided how to, how to proceed with my research. So I could be talking about this for hours, but I won't do that. So I'm gonna focus on what we, could achieve regarding the key aspects that we focused on. One was to do with the supporting media, looking for different media, not gravel, that is the typical from a constructed wetland. So I started looking alternative media that could raise pH because the super river is very acidic and also has a lot of iron, manganese, lead, zinc, the whole periodic table, maybe I would say. And also thinking of that the iron and arsenic are very related in nature, and this water was very rich in iron, that made me assume that the co-precipitation or sorption or precipitation with iron oxides would be important as well. So that's why we highlighted these two routes, thinking that maybe this would be important, maybe not, maybe this would be important, but you need to have sulfur 
in the reduced form, not sulfate. So that was a different challenge for later. So that's where the start. And then after that, at the very end, when we tested the horizontal flow and we tested three different types of media, zeolite, limestone, and cocoa beet, this was to do with the natural ion interchange. Zeolite is very used in water treatment, not for arsenic, but for many things. Limestone, because we needed to raise the pH of the water, and cocoa beet to provide a carbon source for bacteria. That's why we tested this combination. And what did we find? Well, at least with this combination, we discarded in the very first wetlands that we tried, we discarded travel and copper peat because the, the removal efficiencies weren't that high. So we stick to this two at the very end. We tested the two flow types and the hypothesis so far is that horizontal could have a better performance and vertical. And also in the horizontal that they are supposed to be anaerobic, I wanted to find this, which I couldn't find in my PhDs, but I kept that in mind for the future. I said, well, I couldn't find this. I couldn't test, I tried to test, I tried to, I didn't try, I did. I did measure ORP, I did measure dissolved ox oxygen here, but I couldn't prove that they were indeed anaerobic. So I couldn't test the occurrence of this removal mechanism. So, but even though this, I also identified that even though Phragmatis australis, which is a typical wetland plant, did accumulate arsenic, boron, iron, zinc, lead, the accumulation wasn't important in terms of the whole pollutants removed. Even though they did accumulate, I couldn't try, I couldn't test uh, cell controls with no vegetation. I couldn't. I didn't have the time, <laughs> otherwise I would be still there. And also, um, even though this accumulation in terms of uh, mass per unit of mass of root and shoots, it wasn't important in terms of the overall removal, less than 1%, less than 2%. So it was not a big deal because these media were very effective. So probably, and that's something that I'm still thinking about, if you didn't have a very effective media, you would have a more important accumulation in the plants. And people always talked about me about this. What about the plants? Why didn't you test this? Why didn't you test that? It's like, I couldn't, <laughs> but that I kept that in mind. So this is the result of my PhD, besides all the love friends from Australia, Melbourne, and all of that. These four publications, we have the first one, we identify the mechanisms, then the very first test, that we presented in a conference and then we published. And then those two, and this is the final one when we tested the horizontal. And that's it. One page for four years. <laughs> that's the, the sum up. <laughs> well, there is a lot of pages in the papers as well, but here you can see just one page. So I had more questions. Even though we did a lot of progress, on this topic, I kept thinking about other things that we couldn't answer to. Vegetation. I didn't test the absence of vegetation. So that was a question that was still open. Then what happened with the season? Water losses in wetlands are very important. And I couldn't, I didn't have the opportunity to test for a whole year to evaluate the differences between summer, spring, autumn, and winter. And then the most scientific part that we only hypothesized based on water quality analysis and some media analysis was the occurrence of the hypothesized mechanisms. We couldn't verify them. So then I came here, I became a professor here, and I had to, you know, earn some money, graduate the students, otherwise I will be fired. So, <laughs> yes, and you know it's right, you know I'm right, so that's why you laugh. I, had, I formulated this research proposal from the SIT, sponsored by Anit, where I tried to came up with all the ideas, the pending ideas for my PhD, 
focusing on the horizontal flow, focusing on the tested media that I tried to find here in Chile that were very similar, so I could, but mainly on the occurrence of the mechanisms using techniques that I couldn't find, that I couldn't test back in Australia. So what were the aims of this, of this research project that lasted for three years? One had to do with the performance, but for a longer experimental period, a whole year at least, and testing the presence and the absence of the Phragmatic Australis, the same plant that I knew it could tolerate arsenic, boron, salinity, pH, everything. It can tolerate everything, really. Then I was interested in the final part that had to do with where the pollutants went. How much of the whole arsenic that entered the system, the eye and the lead, the zinc, the manganese, where was it? Was in the media? In which media? How much did it go to the plants? That is something that I couldn't reply totally in my PhD. And finally, the most interesting part had to do with proving the speciation of arsenic, maybe, but also iron or whatever I could find the speciation that wasn't easy. So my hypothesis was if I could prove, if I could probe the fractioning, the association of these pollutants, I could say, well, if the media, if, if we go back a few slides, a few years, if I could find, for example, that arsenic was retained in the reduced form with sulfur, that was very different to my focus on my PhD that had to do with the occurrence of iron oxides, very different. So that's what we did with the help of Ignacio that helped me build the wetlands, literally, as you can see here. And actually we built them before the fundacid. So we really had faith that we would have it. Actually, I was thinking about this when I prepared this presentation. Like, what would have happened if we didn't get the, the grant? I don't know, but Ignacio had faith. So I trusted Ignacio. And at the very beginning, as you can see here, the plants were very shy, but then, we watered them for a long time till I got the grant and I could test the system. And they were finally, eventually this high. So what did we do during this, very, this period? We tried at least uh, two different arson concentrations in the inflow, inspired in the Sufer River, as you can see, very nasty water. Why did we do that? Well, I haven't, I didn't have it planned from the beginning because I expected the system to saturate, but it didn't. So during the preliminary results that I'm gonna show you, we found that with this concentration, arsenic was still being removed by around 95%, 97%. It's like, oh my God, please saturate. I wanted the wind plants to saturate so I could estimate the lifespan. That it was something that I couldn't do in my PhD. So it came to me that maybe if we raise the concentration, it's still in the range of the super river, so we could find this situation. So that's why we did that. But then after more than a year of testing with this very nasty water, the idea was to um, destroy the wetlands, well, at least some of them, so we can analyze the supporting media, we can analyze the plants, and then at the very, very end, we could do these sequential extraction procedures are very used in the chemistry area to find the partitioning of pollutants, not arsenic. So that was something really new. The CR has been mainly used for metals and arsenic is very different to metal. And Kion, yes, it was especially designed for arsenic, but nobody so far has used Kion for the wetlands. So that was a good thing. And also other techniques that would help us identificate the species of arsenic maybe and iron. So how was our experimental setup? We had four cell types with two different wetland media, uh, limestone and zeolite. We had the control cells, no vegetation versus the planted cells, the real wetlands, let's say with the phragmatis. We have replicates. And we operated under this hydraulic loading rate. 
And as I was saying, with the very nasty water that I didn't test in my PhD either. Yeah, I only focus on arsenic and boron and iron, but then thank you to the information from the colleagues from Potifis and Rosé Catolica, we could get a better characterization of the super river. So I knew I had to include all this plus the sulfate and the chloride. So it's a very salty water as well. So that's how it looked towards the end. This is the design. Uh, and this is how it looked after we started operating the system. Here we have this accumulation tank. We prepared the synthetic water every two weeks or so. We did the sampling every week, two weeks or so, and the analysis as well. And you can see here how the plants grew and how the iron oxides that I could see, because I know they're orange, uh, they were mainly accumulated at the beginning of the cells. So, and this is the detail of the nasty water. And this, at the beginning, you can see pH around two. And um, a very high concentration of um, uh, sulfate. Um, arsenic around two, that was stage one, lead, iron, <coughs> aluminum, etc. Very nice. So the only thing that we changed for stage two was arsenic. All, this, all, all of the rest remained kind of the same. What did we find? Well, at the beginning, we could see that we could, the, all, the, all the systems, all the four types of cells, limestone with or without plants, zeolite with or without plants, they behave very differently regarding pH adjustment, which is a very important water quality parameter. So we could see from the very beginning that zeolite started kind of well, but then it got stuck around five. Whereas the limestone was actually very high pH, around 7.5 or so, and it didn't decrease, actually didn't decrease throughout the whole time. So I also wanted them to please stop raising the pH, but they didn't, so, but zeolite they did. And then at the beginning, as I said, uh, we found that arsenic and iron were basically to be removed. Actually, we had a lot of issues with the arsenic because most of the measurements were below the detection limit. So we had another issue as well. And with the help of colleagues from SEGA, uh, they didn't want to see me anymore. I knew that if I called them, oh, you know, my samples, and oh, no, I don't want to talk about you again. Your water is so nasty, please, please. But thank you, Veronica, for all the help from SEGA. And so there we go, around one or second year, third year. So in the meantime, as I told you, some conference uh, presentations with Melissa, Pablo, Juan, and Jose, uh, trying to show that we are doing something on progress. So that's why they were posters and conferences. And then the only drawback that we had was to do with boron. Boron is very different to arsenic in the way that it's very hard to remove. So unfortunately, we couldn't remove boron in the official system, but thank you to the contribution of Consuelo. Uh, we had this idea that we tested a different type of media that was rice husk, which is a waste from the rice industry. Um, and also we tested a different plant uh, Taifa, with thank you to the idea of Camila of testing, you know, this different water. And we did find some interesting results, but because we didn't, we didn't remove boron in the other system. So we made this small test and we also tried to make some progress regarding the modeling of these processes. That's something that we also tried to uh, uh, do here in this preliminary so thinking of not only quantifying, but what to do with this data, okay? So, so that was a bonus, I would say. <laughs> that is not to do, that is to do with the fundacid, but it's a different research line, but it's relevant to the topic as well. So what did we find in the end? Uh, the last publication after the year and a half of the testing with the four cell types, with the nasty water, 
And we found that finally, the zeolite couldn't increase the pH as much as the limestone, but it did decrease, but seven is still very nice, really good. But uh, we couldn't find the saturation for neither of the pollutants, not arsenic, not iron, not lead. And worst of all, I was very disappointed, I would say, uh, all the cells were kind of similar, statistically similar. So I really wanted to find a difference between plants, no plants, limestone, zeolite, but we couldn't. I did my best, <laughs> we couldn't. Um, and again, I had, I knew this would happen again because I saw it in my PhD that even though the plants could accumulate a lot in terms of mass per mass, in terms of the overall contribution, most of the pollutants were accumulated in the media, regarding, even though it was limestone or zeolite, the same thing. The other thing that was an important question was to do with the season. And the main thing about the season is not to do with how lives, uh, often in wetlands, the plants get bored or get sad in summer, like me, <laughs> but in winter, I mean, winter, autumn, they get sad because with that sunlight and etc. but it didn't affect the performance, only affect the water losses. So that's another key point that we learned. And overall, even because the pH is higher. Because even though the water is relatively better in terms of the arsenic and metals presence, you can water, you can use this water to irrigate it because it's too acidic. So the only option is to use the water from the lens. So the whole story, this was the advanced story, work in progress with Ignacio Jose. And then finally, the last publication when we could sum up all the findings, or at least the most important that had to do with the performance. However, we still have some questions to reply to that had to do with which form of arsenic, which form of iron were removed and how. So that was not an easy question to reply to, and actually haven't still quite work it out. So as I told you before, we dismantle the wetlands, we take samples from different layers, from different wetlands, with or without plants. And we did, well, Jose did the uh, Keon uh, SEP, um, Juan did the Tassier test, and still trying to figure it out to put the whole story together, and also to do with the results from the from so that's still on work and then the project finished and then what i'm gonna do i'm gonna get fired so <laughs> what do i do well even though getting fired is a concern I still had this idea that at some point we could use the system to treat water with arsenic, but still a lot of points missing. For example, the representation of the performance, how can we effectively represent all the removal mechanisms in a model that could help me have a design guideline that are missing? This is a very important difference with the wetlands for water treatment. Most of the applications in the world are to do with wastewater or rainwater. That is very similar in the world. However, our polluted water with arsenic is very different to that in Bangladesh, to that in Mexico, to that in Argentina. So arsenic is a challenge. So I was still thinking, well, what can we do with all this? Apart from publishing. So I would say we tested uh, we focus on the qualitative characteristic of the systems, thinking of the new media, thinking of the plants that could effectively resist these very nasty conditions. The carbon source that 
it didn't quite work out. Uh, and the flow types that I still would say the horizontal are the most promising ones. But on the other hand, I'm still an engineer. So I wanted to quantify, I wanted to provide some idea, some foundation for the design guidelines. So what did the world say about arsenic and metals? Well, let's try the typical, that word for DBO, nitrogen, you know, all the boring things. And uh, it didn't work. Neither the zero order or the model, neither the first order. None of them um, empirical, linear, statistical models, none of them worked. So then what is coming now is to do with the mechanistic modeling of the performance of constructed wetlands, tritium, water with arsenic, but not only having in hand arsenic, but also all the water quality, because the reactivity of arsenic makes very different to wastewater or rainwater. So that's what Diego's doing now. So Diego Bravo, he's gonna build a very nice mechanistic model for constructed wetlands, and he's gonna get his PhD degree as well. And he's trying to sum up all the empirical work that we've done, and also with colleagues from the world, from Professor Joan Garcia, with Professor Teresa Herrera, and other colleagues, uh, Jorens, Olmos Marquez, that they also work on empirical systems. But then now we are thinking about how to use all of that to build this model to help us, hopefully, provide these design guidelines. So to sum up, this is a still a challenge, even though we have solved, at least in Chile, not in Latin America, not in Bangladesh, we have solved the arsenic issue, at least for drinking water purposes, we still have some other uses that we need, irrigation. Conservation of ecosystems is also a water use. And even though concerted wetlands are very popular in the world, um, they are mainly used for a different kind of water. And what we found is that they do have the potential to remove arsenic and another, another pollutants, non-conventional pollutants. And the, the limitation to effectively implement the systems is the lack of the sign guidelines. So that's we are focusing now to make this lab, to take the leap between the empirical area and the modern area, trying to aim to these engineering systems designs, which is the final aim. So I have to acknowledge all the people, especially one C Tim and David from Monash University, who support my PhD studies and also I need that also supported my PhD studies. And of course, the, all the staff from the civil engineering department, such as Viviana, Manuel, that help us build the systems and the, um, to do the water quality testing as well. And all the students that started thinking from the very beginning before the fund the seed and then after the fund the seed that had anything to do with either wetlands or arsenic. So thank you very much to all of you as well. And if you're interested, you can still watch me more on YouTube. <laughs> and there are different topics they're kind of different. If you're interested in arsenic, you have to watch uh, this two years ago. And uh, we have some broader ones. Actually, this one is, I gave it to a general audience in Municipalidad de Loan Metea, but I only talked about water quality. No arsenic, well, a little bit, but mainly water quality. And this focused on water quality in Chile. So thank you all. I hope this was. Nice to you to hear and discuss. So that's it for today. Right. Thank you very much again, Catherine, for accepting our invitation and for being here and for, for your interesting talk. Uh, so now we're happy to take any questions from the audience and also from the people who are watching on YouTube. Please feel free to post your questions on our YouTube channel. Uh, any questions for Catherine? You are not 
if you don't feel confident about your English, you can formulate them in Spanish and we can translate. That's totally fine. Well, I have a couple of questions. I knew, <laughs> I knew. Yeah, Catherine. Uh, so the first question is related to the, to the various types of cells that you tested. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any type of cell that you did not test for any reason and that you type could... of cells or type of media? Anything. Uh, <laughs> oh, there's so many well, configurations. At the, at the very beginning, at the very, very beginning, uh, with the on the first experiment, when I showed you these PVC pipes, and they were literally PVC pipes, storm water pipes, the very first ones, um, we didn't quite know how they the performance would be, so we tested these four media, these four. So this is the typical supporting media of wetlands. Most of wetlands uh, have gravel as the supporting media. And then I thought, well, we have to try anything that's better because gravel is not gonna raise the pH at all. So I was thinking of a carbon source that was, we, tried, we tested the cocoa pit, we, we wanted to test speed, but in Australia it's protected. So I had to buy the cocoa pit from fiber, coconut fiber. And uh, limestone that is very used to treat uh, acid mine drainage and zeolite that is very used in water treatment in general. So uh, after the first experiment with the vertical flow wetlands, uh, the very first one, this one, <laughs> we discarded gravel and cocoa pit. Well, cocoa pit was kind of, on hold because we tested the combination with limestone. Um, so that's where the four that we tested. And then that's why on, in the fundacy, I focus on these two, which were the most effective to my criteria. Okay. What about vegetation types? How important is it? Well, that's a good question. Uh, because my, the research was mainly focused on the role of media. This is the PhD, yet. Yes, the PhD, yes. So, uh, I couldn't uh, test different type, type of plants because the focus was on the different combination of media. So once in my supervisor said, well, I'm, I'm going to bet on phragmatis because they are very tolerant to drought, to salinity, to arsenic. So that's why we, we stick to this one. Because that was the, the main focus was to test combinations of media, combinations of flow types, and then we kept this fixed. And then after, when I came back here, I knew that I could find them here in Tibet, and I knew that the accumulation wasn't really important in terms of the contribution to the overall removal. So it's like, why bother? But I know because in every conference, people always ask me, why didn't you try Eliostaris? Why didn't you try Typha? Why did it wasn't on the list. And also it has been shown not only by me, but also by other researchers that for metals and metalloids, such as arsenic, this is not the main source of removal. And may or may not. In hydroponic systems, if you didn't have the media, probably, and that's to do with other phytoremediation techniques, not a wetland, but a hydroponic system, that's very different because all the, all the arsenic is going to go to the plant, either the root or the shoot. But that's a different system. So depending on the case, but the thing is, if you have a good media, the arsenic is gonna go there by precipitation, sorption, et cetera. If you don't have the media, the arsenic is gonna go to the plant. But still, even with some studies, the few studies that we took, Buddha won 2004, he only tested gravel with the plants and still the accumulation wasn't really important. Still the, the arsenic was in the media, even though it was gravel. So I really didn't have an, an important reason to test different type of plants. I don't know if that replies to your answer, but look. Yes, yes, uh, and actually uh, this- Actually, you have more questions now. <laughs> more questions. Uh, are there uh, any other pollutants for which plant type is more important? Yes, yes. I have a colleague, Emily. Uh, she studied nitrogen removal. So if you are gonna remove Nitrogen, the type of plant is very important because nitrogen is a nutrient. So there are plants that prefer nitrate or ammonia over other things. But in this case, in this case, uh, the type of plant is not really important. 
And actually the role of plan is mainly indirect. It's not to do with the accumulation, it's to do with the provision of organic matter, the surface for the ion oxides to precipitate. So it's a different kind of role. Okay, cool. Uh, any other questions from our audience or from people watching us on YouTube? Felipe? Well, that's something that I wanted to find and I couldn't. That's and on and it's a very particular case because you have to bear in mind that all of most of the testing that I did was to do with the super river, which uh, as funny as it may sound, it's easier to find to treat water that is very polluted. So in this case, for this very nasty water, it's not only arsenic that is very high, but also iron. And because the water is very acidic, first one, stage one, stage one, you raise the pH, and then you have all these iron oxides, and then you retain most of it, most of everything, lead, manganese, whatever it can absorb onto this iron oxide. So, uh, but it's much more challenging, and that's where we have to think about now, um, what happens with groundwater that has pH, I don't know, eight, seven, that has low or non-ion and has, I don't know, fluoride. That's the case in Mexico, for example. So all of this, all of the design and all the decisions that Pablo was asking me was were to do with the quality of the water. So it's very different. It would have been a very different story if I had focused on Bangladesh water or Mexico water. So that is, that's why this is a challenge because it's not only to do with the concentration of arsenic itself, but it's also to do with the overall water quality because due to the reactivity of the arsenic. So going back to your question, one of the aims of treating, of operating, operating the system for more than a year was to eventually find, eventually find the, the moment where they started decreasing the removal capacity. And we only found that with the pH. So, and then I had to finish the project, so <laughs> I couldn't keep going with that. And there's some tests that I thought of doing, uh, these break, breakthrough curves in a column, for example, but I couldn't escalate that to this kind of system. So, so yes, yeah, that's still an open question for you. <clears throat> No, I think that, as I was saying, um, this non saturation capacity was to do um, with the high effectiveness of the limestone and CLA. So, because I'm, I'm sure if I had if we had built the wetlands with gravel, we would have seen that. But we were aiming at the very best performance. But on the other hand, we couldn't find this, uh, this lifespan that is still an issue for the same purposes. It's like, if you wanna treat this flow with this uh, concentration for this time to this rate, the system is gonna, long for, gonna last for, I don't know, five years, five years, one year. I can't tell you that, I just can't. But that's the, the thing that we have to bear in mind to provide the design guidelines as well. And that's why we need to uh, have a mechanistic model that may tell us what this, this, this lifespan is. Thanks for the question. Any other questions? No? Okay, have another question. Felipe, okay. he raised his hand yeah. first. <laughs> Oh, well, uh, that's something that I explored on a different uh, research line that had to do with this, but wasn't thinking of arsenic, wasn't, was thinking of uh, copper and sulfate. So it could, but it will depend again on the, what, which are the key pollutants to target. And um, I'm not very familiar with the mining industry, apart from the Asufri River, which is a drainage, but I'm not very sure how the 
plan of the Sierra work in terms of, uh, I, I think the main idea is to avoid the active uh, additioning of uh, Calviva, Cal, Cal, you know, so instead of, and that's why the, um, these passive systems do, that they are still considered a kind of wetland, but not quite. And that's why we use limestone in the, in the end, because uh, limestone is quite used in these uh, passive systems, even for groundwater, because you know that eventually you're going to raise the pH for acidic waste. And you know that there's some metals always there. And you know that if you raise the pH, you're going you're gonna to get this, um, this sludge here, and it's going to stay there. Um, but yeah, I, you have to look uh, further into which, uh, wh what, are the, what the pollutants are, what's the water quality overall. Um, but yeah, this has been done uh, somewhere else uh, with the limestone drains. That's the name that I couldn't remember, sorry, limestone drains. Okay. Kathy, <laughs> uh, can you please elaborate on, on the role of evapotranspiration for our arsenic removal? How important is it? Um, for arsenic removal or overall in constructed wetlands? Both. Both. Well, <laughs> well, at the very beginning, because we had no idea what we were doing, <laughs> uh, at least I had no idea, and I had to test everything. When we, had, when we started this system, I didn't talk about uh, a lot about the operation, which is very important, but it's, it's to do with your question. So hold, hold on for a second. Uh, here with these uh, stormwater pipes, I literally uh, poured the water like this. I, asked, I was gar watering my garden. So this was my garden, the only garden that I had in Australia. Um, and then I couldn't, I didn't have a pump. I didn't control the outlet. I was just water because we didn't have any money either. So, so I just, uh, we didn't think about that at the very beginning because because of the surface, like the diameter was very quite small, I would say. So yeah, here we are. This, this diameter is around, I don't know, 15 centimeters. So this area of evaporation was an important. And because the water didn't stay there for long either, we didn't think about, we didn't look at that at all. But as long as we were making progress, and at some stage, I think uh, David, um, McCarthy, another of my supervisors said, well, what about wave transpiration? And uh, then I started looking uh, more into details because as you can see here, my system were still quite small. The ones here, the ones that we built for the fundus, they were much bigger. So there were much more surface exposed to the atmosphere. So here we, 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 we estimated the ETM was very, the, very low as well because this one we tested for three months. But this one, I knew that it, it was important because even some colleagues uh, on uh, arsenic, they corrected, uh, I should show you this. They corrected, they corrected the concentrations in the outlet because they lost a lot of water. So if you lose, 50% of the water and you measure the same concentration in the outlet, it doesn't mean that you're not removing anything at all. It means that you lose half of the water. And if you measure the same, it means that you remove 50%. So that's the correction that we actually, we did them, but because we had very good removal, we didn't, we didn't notice that. But other colleagues, they, they did that because they lost a lot of water. Here we measure we estimated DT with the meteorological data, but then, but also we measure the difference between the in, inflow because here we had pumps, so we know we knew how much water was getting into each cell for the experimental period, and then we weighted the water from the outlet um, with a weight. So, uh, in the worst scenario, that was uh, spring and summer, we lost thirty percent, around thirty percent. That's on the papers, but. Uh, in terms of the performance, it didn't, you couldn't see this difference in terms of the concentration. It didn't affect the performance in terms of the concentration, but we, that's a drawback for this technology, especially in areas such as here that we have a lot of ET in spring. So we, we, we quantified it 
And also we corrected the concentrations when we could. <clears throat> So this kind of technology should work better in places where the evaporative ratio is smaller? Is that what you mean? Um, well, the, the, tea, the main thing about the tea is if you're going to reduce this water, you're going to lose water. But on the other hand, there are some wetlands that are designed to evaporate all the water. So you don't have to discharge anything. Uh, that's the other extreme. But everything depends on what you want to do with the outflow. So in this case, because it was research project, we didn't, we wanted to characterize everything. And, uh, but if you did that to provide water for irrigation in a small town, for example, you would lose 30% here in Santiago. So at the plan and all that, you have to look at it, but you have to bear in mind that when you lose water, the pollutants concentrate inside the reactor. So that's a different issue. So, you may still be removing, but the concentration in the outflow will be still high even though you remove. And that's important because in the end, what you care about is complying with the regulation. The regulator doesn't care if you removed or not. He doesn't care. He cares about that the outflow actually can achieve a certain quality. I don't know if that replies your, yeah, yeah, yeah. your question or not, but no, please tell me. No, no, no. <laughs> Thank you very much, Catherine. Any other questions for, for Catherine? Okay, so we want to thank you again, no, Catherine. No. Oh, no, there's a question the 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 Can I, should I look at here? Maybe it's not questions. Yeah. Ah. Other according, questions? yeah. According to presenter, Greg, the remodel was since the beginning until from the time. Yes. What were the environmental conditions? I mean, temperature, altitude, climate, finally. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you, Laura, for the con for the congratulations. Yeah. Uh, the, this was all of the cysts that we, that we showed here. That is uh, Santiago, Chile. I don't know the latitude. You guys know the latitude. I have no idea of the, our latitude, I must say. Um, but, Minus 33. Minus 33. So this is a, a Mediterranean climate, very dry for the last 10, 15 years, very dry. Um, yeah, and temperature, uh, we have, I think Javier did that with the monitoring station from Parque Higgins, that was the closest, our, the colleagues here from uh, the, the geophysical department. So somewhere, that's somewhere, you know, in some of a student's uh, thesis. Um, but yeah, that was a very th that's something that we, we, we covered, but it could be worse or it could be better, like in the South. And here, and I didn't, I'm surprised you didn't ask me this. We covered this. So we avoid uh, having the inflow from the precipitation. Mm. It barely precipitated that year. But we didn't want to include the water from the rain because we couldn't, we couldn't be accurate enough to quantify this uh, into the hydrological balance. And we didn't have any losses except from ET. So our water balance was, I knew how much is coming in. We waited the water coming out, but we couldn't measure it, but we waited. And then we had this protection and um, and we have the major gel data that is somewhere bad. Uh, yeah, Laura, we know that, uh, and that is a drawback, or as you can see, could think of, about it, about, about a drawback for the losses of water. But also the weather was, um, the plants could survive and grow. And uh, even some colleagues from the north, uh, Professor Veda, he has tested the systems in Iquique, for example. That is much, I don't know the latitude of Iquique, maybe you guys can help me, but, um, it's very different. Our Laura, you have to come to Chile. It's a, lot, it's a wonderful country. We have everything here. Um, but uh, if you, if we look at Altiplano, for example, or where the places where we were aiming at implementing the system, thinking of the Azufre River that is somewhere here, that is a very extreme uh, weather, desertic. So here. So the Sufre River, it's um, born close to Bolivia. 
actually we got to Bolivia. Not on purpose, but we got there. So here the weather is very extreme. It's very, 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 very dry. It's very cold in the morning, very hot in the day, the whole year. So it's very different uh, to, to that year in Utah that is here, here, uh, Loa, Salado da Gama, everything is very different and we are much uh, south. Santiago is much south. So, so yeah, but that's a very important thing to bear in mind, Laura, so thank you. I think there was an, another question. No, I think it was. Uh, no, ah, you're welcome, Gonzalo. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you very much, Catherine, for coming here. You're welcome. Um, oh, yeah. So thank you all for coming today. Um, so, our Next webinar will be next Thursday. Uh, Dr. Hugo Ulloa, who is assistant professor at the University of Pennsylvania, will talk about the dynamics of ice covered water bodies. So don't miss our upcoming exciting webinar. Yeah, and also, I'm sorry about that. Don't miss uh, Diego Bravo's seminar, doctoral seminar in December. So the follow up of the whole story. Yes. So please come. That, that was broadcasted via YouTube also. Ah, okay, on YouTube as well. Yeah. Okay, so Nico will make sure that it will be broadcasted yeah. on YouTube. Thank but, you, Nico. But it's gonna be a hybrid webinar, so we need you to come. Yes, you guys, you guys have to come. Yeah, you have to come. You have okay. to come. All right, thank you very much and take care. Sí, 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 sí. Fue a la tele, no sé.